afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here and for being patient. Um, you know, Brickley Park is crazy. So it's hard to get a park and get in this place. Um, so I'm Ada McNeil, um, one of the co-collaborators, co-conspirators of the Chicago Black Social Culture Map, uh, and also the Artistic and Managing Director of Honey Pop Performance. And um, CBSCM is one of our, has grown into one of our uh, long-standing projects, which is amazing. Came out of a performance project in 2014 that was called You Cry Hand Clap and was really thinking about houses connections, uh, Chicago houses connections to the earlier black social forms uh, that poured into it. Um, and we wanted to honor the stories and the wisdom and the expertise of the folks who created the form who continue to be the bearers uh, and continue to pass it on now uh, to next generations. So um, we have amazing collaborators uh, who are part of our team, uh, as well as uh, Vintage House and the Dance Music Archiving Foundation and are actively archiving, um, who are also concerned with documenting this history um, and, and uh, archiving the stories. So uh, I wanna say a quick shout out to the main members that were the main collaborators, Joe Depressor, Dwayne Powell, uh, Lori Branch, uh, Lauren Lowry, Skyla Hearn, um, all of the folks who are part of Honey Pot, Abra, Aisha, <laughs> my brain is Jen, Kamiko. Uh, Linnea has come on uh, recently uh, as our social media coordinator. Um, so big shout out to you and happy birthday. <laughs> Uh, and forgive me if I'm forgetting anybody else. Um, but so now we're gonna start our first panel. For the, We are also really excited to be moving back into live programming after uh, the brunt of the pandemic and moving things online. Uh, so it's really a pleasure today to have these uh, uh, original architects here with us. So we're part of the scene to talk about uh, this first panel, what it takes to build a party um, and uh, their kind of uh, historical experiences with that and what they continue to do now. So I'm gonna introduce our moderator, Lori Branch, and then she will get into the uh, introducing our panelists and their conversation. Um, and there will be time at the end for Q&A, so you know, think about your comments and questions. We would like to have a bit of uh, spirited discussion before we take a break and go into the next panel. Um, so Lori Branch is a Chicago native um, that began her lifelong affair with music in 1980 as the DJ for a, sh a Chicago-based social club called Vertigo. I just had to bring it up since Craig was here too. Um, and um, Lori is, uh, has over 35 years of experience as a local artist, DJ, and public health advocate. Um, and has been featured in many house documentaries and podcasts. Um, and she has the honor and distinction of being one of the first uh, women DJs in Chicago's historic uh, house music scene. Um, Lori also co-hosts, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Vintage House uh, radio program, which is amazing and is on Wednesday nights, every Wednesday night. And podcast. And podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, at 10 p.m.? Oh, I think it's 10 p.m. WNUR 89.3. Okay, W, that's right. WNUR.org, okay. Um, and so I'm going to now turn it over to Lori. Thank you. And get into this conversation. Thank you all. Thank you. Can we give Maida a hand for just bringing us all together here? Uh, I think that uh, it goes without saying that she and her whole crew are just visionary and so important to this movement to preserve our history. Uh, the history of club culture, the history of dance culture, the history of black music in this city. So thank you, thank you, Maida, for all that you do and continue to do. So let's get into it. Um, I'm really excited to host this discussion with truly architects of a party. I love the title. Um, it takes a lot of work to put together successful events, to put together successful clubs. You wonder why people do it, you know, week after week. I'm, I'm sure you wonder that too sometimes, but we'll, we'll get into it. But first I want to introduce folks. Um, right here is my buddy, uh, Craig Loftus. She's, we smiled at Vertical because that was Craig's club 
Social clubs were a big deal, you know, they still are, but back then, before we had social media, and before we had such immediate access to, to everything, everything was about the social club in the 70s and 80s and even early 90s. And so it was, a, it was a hard way to promote, but if you were successful, you were very successful because word of mouth is what carried you forward. Craig was the, one of the originators of our group Vertigo, a high school group, we would, we would throw parties, well they do parties and they eventually recruited me as a DJ uh, across the city, high schools all over the, the city, Lim Bloom, and you know, we had select high schools that we chose from. Uh, it's, there's a whole story behind that. That's a different panel. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, you'd see anywhere between 500, 2,000 kids on any given night showing up to these parties, lines out the doors for several years. This happened under Craig's leadership. So I want to introduce Craig. Uh, Craig is, is also a promoter, uh, club manager, uh, and he is what I like to call a master of all trades. He's a ma not a jack of a master of all trades. No. He is, <laughs> he designs, when you think about an architect of a party, this guy designs every element of it. So he literally builds the furniture and the, literally like from scratch, from wood that he buys and cushions and drapery, like lighting. He does everything to create the atmosphere he even cooks the food often, like catering, decorations. And on top of all of that, he is this internationally known recording artist and producer. Um, he had a hit called Mary Mary in the mid-90s, 95, that went international. You can still hear this around the world. You know, if you're like in a set over in, I don't know, South Africa, Australia, you'll hear Mary Mary. That's Craig Loftus. So, he has come, been come to known as just sort of the ultimate curator of an experience, and so I'm really just excited to hear from Craig personally. Um, so just welcome, give a big round of applause for Craig Loftus. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Tonka Toy, Tonka Toy is an event manager, a consultant. Uh, she hosts some of the most major parties across the city. Uh, I think that um, people would refer to Tonka as sort of a new age, this is what term that I heard, a new age promoter. So I, I don't know what that means. I'm going to ask you to ex explain it, but I've heard that said about you, that you're a new age promoter. So in my spiritual word, that's a whole like, you know, like kind of mystical thing. So maybe it is for you. Uh, she, as a CEO of, of travel agency, FSG, she handles all so to the artist management and travel experiences for the Chosen Few event, Chosen Few uh, picnic, which we used to call, but it's called the Chosen Few weekend. The Chosen Few festival is probably the largest house music festival in the United States. Tonka handles all the logistics as it relates to artist management and travel for that. In addition to just being, you know, probably the most, one of the most successful promoters of events in Chicago, especially on the South Side. So give it up for Tonka Toy. You can find her on TikTok and all social media. And Dwayne Woods, what can we say about Dwayne Woods? Uh, uh, Dwayne knows sound. Dwayne knows sound. I mean, it's, it's hard to say anything else about this. You've been at this since 1979, 1978, long time. I, I know you don't look that old. Black do not crack. I mean, come on, look at this guy. Not a wrinkle anywhere. Um, he is just really one of the best sound people known in Chicago. Um, Craig wants to chime in. I can see him oh, chomping no, at the I'm bit. Fine, you want no, to say no. something about Craig? You're, you're right. He is one of the best sound um, cer Certainly has helped me out and many other DJs uh, by just cre making sure the sound is right. I DJ with a group called um, Good Girls. And Lady D, we, we talk about you. Many of us talk about Dwayne when we're at places and the sound ain't right. We're like, we need like Dwayne Woods. Like, yeah. where, where is Dwayne, you know? Because we know it's going to be right. It makes all the difference. So give a warm welcome to Dwayne. All right, let's, let's get into it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk, we're going to talk for like maybe 20 minutes or so, and then I'd love to open it up once you get to know a little bit more about these guys. Um, but when you hear the word architect of a party, what does that mean for you? And I want to start with you, Tonka. What does that mean? Well, you Here's know, from a, oh, from a promoter's perspective, um, to me, that is, um, you know, someone who understands what it takes to put a party together from, you know, from, you know, the venue to getting the people in there. Um, and, 
not on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so being a, for me, being an architect is me figuring out ways to get the people to come to the event. Um, and I am like, you know, thinking of uh, DJs that would bring them in, venues that would bring them in, and even like, you know, the venue that, you know, the lodge, it's like you still have to think of ways, and that's where Craig kind of comes in, think of ways of making it a different experience every time you come, if that's possible. Um, but yeah, being an architecture is being someone who, um, you know, has a structure and puts that structure into reality, you know, like they have a, something in mind. You know, that's kind of like if you're building, if you're thinking about putting up a building or something like that, and you are thinking, you have an idea in your head, and then now it's like, how do I execute it? How do I make this a reality? And you just kind of put the th steps together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and again, my part is getting the people in and thinking about what it's going to take to get it, uh, get the people yeah, in. Yeah, I, I want to hear some of that what it takes in a minute, but okay. let me hear from Dwayne. And you're an architect of sound, sonic well, experience. When I think of the parties and uh, promoters that call or DJs, and you talk about the the beginning of a party, you know, to the end, we usually consult with how big is the room, how many people you're expecting, um, what type of music is going to be played. Uh, a lot of that plays a big part in what equipment I bring out. Then it's the budget, you know, what can people afford. Um, and sometimes it's the hours of service. It could be a long time that people expect you to be there working, how difficult it is to get into a venue. You know, some people just walk up the stairs, but when you're talking about carrying you know, 20 speakers <laughs> up some stairs, you know, that gets a little uh, difficult sometimes. Um, and then uh, uh, we have to consult ourselves with the electricity. It's just so many things. And, and it, when something goes wrong, everybody looks at the sound man like, what's the problem? I mean, everybody. So they the look at the DJ so, first. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so when yeah. you talk about the architect of a party, you know that's a, a lot of my perspective of the building block. Now, uh, the other aspects of promoting what DJs they use, I concern myself with that too because sometimes that involves, you know, the pay of the night. You know, somebody has big dreams and thoughts about how the party is going to go, but you've been doing this for so long, you can see that it's not being prepared properly. And that might be one that you have to address a certain way. But um, working with promoters and DJs, uh, to give them what they want, that's what I have to do. And uh, that's what I think about when, when I get that phone call about a party. Thanks, Dwayne. Craig. OK. <laughs> that's a good one. I would look at it more of an architectural firm, in my perspective. And what that means is, is that if I come up with a concept and a design idea, I have to incorporate both of them and everybody. We work as a team to come together to pull it off. It's not just, you know, it, it's a lot of moving parts. But as Lori was saying, I go a little above and beyond because I design furniture and, and design the club, I do the decoration, I do the food and all that other stuff, and even come up with the concept or be between Toy and I, because Toy works with me at the lodge, we'll come up with the concept of the event itself. And then it's just a part of, sometimes I can be real radical and just come up with crazy ideas that I know could work, but you need to have someone in your corner that pulls it into perspective mm -hmm. to allow you to put it together. For example? Know? Well, um, well, uh, I have to come back to that one. Okay. But there has been quite a few. You know, I'll come up with a I remember crazy. a certain pajama party. Yeah. Where there, were beds, <laughs> there were strategic beds placed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just had a pajama party. I wanted to have everybody to come out in their pajamas. It's a, it's a house music event. So what I did was I went and bought a ton, ton of blow-up beds. And I had VIP sections in my club. And so I had each VIP section had a bed in it. I even went to the point, again, like I said, going over the top. I went and bought and had custom-made house shoes 
made for everybody that came in. They had the lodge on it and all of that. You know, th these are the things that I feel being an architect of an event makes it stand out that you're not just going to a party. You know, and then when people are treated like that, they remember that. So the next time they see an event at the lodge, or they see Tonka's name, or they see my name, they know that, oh, there's something special that's gonna happen here. It's not just the doors open and sound. Now let's go to sound. I come from Frankie Knuckles and Robert Williams School of Entertainment. Props to Robert Williams, who is in the audience. right there. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, he is our godfather of house music, of dance music in Chicago without Robert Williams. None of us would probably be sitting here. Yeah, none of us would be sitting here. Okay. But um, one of the main things that I was taught back then was it was all about the sound. Decor is good and all of that, but you could have a beautiful room and all of this and have every little trinket that you want to have in there, but if the sound is not right when it comes to house music, then the party's not right. See, you have to create a space. This is where a lot of people make their mistake at. And this is one of the reasons why I created the Lodge. We went through a long period of time here in Chicago since Robert's Club and Frankie's Club had closed that you could no longer experience house music. You can hear it, but you can't experience it. You have to have the right sound system to experience it. When you can experience a song, it takes it to a whole nother level, and then that's when you start developing classics. That's when people say that, and that's because a person didn't just hear that song, they truly experienced it. That's why we have a big problem with a whole generation of people that won't let go of the classic house music to embrace all the new great music that's out now. And the only one of the main reasons is because when they came out, they were listening to sound systems when we were younger that Dwayne put together, Frenchie put together. I mean, really good sound systems, and they got to experience that music. We got to experience the music at the warehouse and places like that. We didn't just hear it, and we grew up on that. Craig, would you say, when you say experience, one of the things that Robert has said in a couple of interviews was that what made Frankie Knuckles, who we consider the godfather of house music here, um, and even Ron Hardy to, to a lesser degree, but um, so, so important was not what they played, it was how they played, it was the application, exactly. it was your word. I tend to think of that as like the first time you may have seen a movie in 3D. Like imagine if you're seeing movies that are just kind of one dimensional all your life and suddenly you're immersed in a 3D experience. You're like, oh, what the hell is going on here? What and just happened? What just right. happened right. to movies? Like suddenly I, I didn't understand like what it was all about until right now. And I feel like when people talk, you know, about the warehouse and some of these clubs, like, you know, back in when we were all very young, um, that that to me is what it's likened to. It's like, it's like, okay, this is what music is supposed to actually sound like. And this feeling that I have, I've never felt it before. So you kind of cling to that. Exactly. You know, you have this reverence exactly. for, for this period. So in that vein, would you, what, when you think about music, atmosphere, presentation, promotions, you know, what do you think, Taka, is most important to you? And why? What's most important to me is um, kind of how I started the last time I was uh, talking is um, getting, figuring out how to get the people in. So you know, there's a yes. thousand parties going on yes. every uh, day, pretty much, you know. So it's like, okay, how do I get them to come to my party? And how does that work? And it starts off with, uh, you know, you, you think of a date, you know, unless it's a regular or, you know, weekly thing, but for the most part, we're not really quite weekly, and then I get asked to promote parties where it's like spread out. So first off, um, you think of a date, uh, and for me, I like to come up with themes because themes help in promoting, you know, just kind of like when we did the pajama party, we have a Halloween party. Um, we have a couple other parties that we did where, uh, like Valentine, you know, uh, so we uh, have a theme, right? And um, we come up with a name that's catchy name or something like that, something that, you know, you see it like, oh, you know, that, that sounds cool. Um, then 
you think of the DJs that would complement the theme or the venue, if it's a different venue or uh, whatever the case, you think of the DJs for, like Craig and I, we think of DJs, that's another thing. It's not as simple as just saying, oh, okay, you play. You also want to keep in mind, you want DJs that complement each other in a sense, in their style of playing, you know. Um, so you gotta think of that, you know, what DJs are gonna pull, and I'm being quite honest, you know, <laughs> you want the DJs who actually um, have a following of their own, for the most part, and actually for us, we don't, you know, the, the, them promoting is not their job, however, they have their own uh, crowd where they have a reach, you know, that we can't get to. You know, so that's another thing. We kind of look at the DJs who don't mind sharing the event to make sure they get their people out. So those are the, that's the beginning uh, stages. Now for me, I've always been very particular about flyers because as they say, you have one first impression, mm -hmm. you know. So for me, I don't like a cheesy flyer because. She's very particular. I'm very particular. <laughs> But, you know, but he, he gets it, you know, because he does flyers, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, just to give you an idea, um, before Craig and I uh, connected on the party, you know, doing parties, um, one of the first parties that I actually designed, not me personally, but I had an idea of the the way I wanted the design on the flyer to go. And I was very fortunate, um, rest in peace, he's gone now, but... My graphic artist, he was really good with taking my vision and putting it to life. Um, so one time, uh, the first one, I literally, I got off work, I worked out I got off work. He was close, his offices were kind of close um, by my job. So I went over and we literally, from like 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon, to about 3.30 in the morning, sat there working on this flight. And the flyer, actually, I don't know if you guys have a slideshow or something, but the flyer, I put it in like a collage that I have, but the flyer was amazing. And um, it was just like, when we put it out, and even Mike Dunn, you know, because Mike Dunn was, um, he was uh, part of, he was one of the DJs. And he was like, wow, Tonka, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was like, you see it, and it's like, whoa, what's this? This is so cool. So immediately, you you got an interest. You know, okay, what's going on here? So, you know, so you capture the attention. And then, of course, the other things play a role and uh, play a part in it. Like I said, the DJ, the venue. Um, and, um, you know, that that first impression is everything. You know, you see a cheesy-looking flyer, you're like, oh, what is this? You know, unless that's a part of the thing, you know, make it really plain. But that's a make it cheesy, right? <laughs> right. Um, we did a cheesy party one time. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so yeah, so that's one of the things. Um, then the next thing is to um, the way I promote, and I um, I did start with uh, the disc formerly from uh, the radio station, but he kind of helped me. He was like a master in marketing. And I got a lot of those ideas, uh, a lot of information from him because he did a lot of research. And I learned how there is like certain times of the day to promote on social media and get the biggest audience. So I kind of, you know, I got that from him and I took it and I really, you know, I, that was a big part of my promoting. I knew when I got the biggest audience and my flyers uh, and my promotions would have legs. They'd keep going and going without me even having to ask. You know, so that is a big thing, determining when I'm gonna put my blast out. Another thing is, you know, it's easy to just throw a flyer out there. I also would put something in the body of, you know, the body of the post to, bring their attention to it as well. You know, like, okay, we see the flyer, we're blown away by the flyer. And people only, they barely read the flyers, you know. So that kind of helps them. But I also put something in to kind of make it fun and, and you know, uh, make them want to share it. Another thing is I like to use photos, um, and they give me permission if the photo is taken in the right. venue. And in most cases, what we do is we try to take pictures, uh, like action shots, you know, and it, it makes people want to say, oh, I want to see what this is like. So another thing I do is um, I always make sure I show some of the 
um, patrons that come, some of the dancers and things like that. They, one, they love to see themselves in a post, mm -hmm. um, and they'll share it, you know, but also um, it just brings more fun to it, you know. So then now you're tagging people, other people are tagging, and so on and so <laughs> on. So, um, But those are my steps to promoting. And I'm also very, when they come in, they see me. Mm -hmm. I'm very present. Um, and I make sure I show them love because I appreciate, I really appreciate each one, each one that comes up to me, I hug them, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, but that's huge because there's a lot of promoters out here. And one of the things, uh, um, like I and I were just talking about is like one of the things was you can be a hell of a promoter, you know, and know how to get them in, but you want to keep them, you know, you want to keep them loyal and you keep them loyal by, um, just showing your appreciation for them. I appreciate that you said that because I, I can't tell you how many parties that I went to as a young adult and especially these were spaces for queer kids um, where the the I would say the promoter or the owner was just like look we're giving you a space and you get in the door and it's like ten dollars keep it moving right. I'm just like fuck is this the best we can do like okay all right you know that's the best we got so when that culture shifted where you know we were owning our own spaces as a community, and I really felt the difference, like people honoring our presence, you know, there. But uh, I, and I, I'm glad to hear that that's the experience for you. I want to I want to kind of get back to this idea of architecture. So when everything goes well, you have a building that's standing and everything is smooth, all all cylinders are on. You've had a great party, you've made money. Whatever your de definition of success is, it happens. What happens when the architecture is off? And Dwayne, you alluded to this a little bit. So when something's not quite right, and you and we'll talk about what happens with the postmortem, because I know Craig likes to talk about how, why things went the way they did. When it's not right, what happened? What happened to that party? Well, if I get the phone call uh, from a DJ or, well, if it's from a DJ, I don't worry about it. But if it's from a promoter trying to have a party, then the f first thing comes up is, uh, you know, does it sound like this is going to be successful? You know, because I, a lot of people have a lot of ideals about how, where, and when. But if they're not put together right, uh, you know, we start asking for uh, money in advance and things like that because if you have to been out here for so long, you kind of see the signs of something that might not go right. You see the signs of something going to be a, a big boom, and then you see the signs of one's going to be a big flop. And uh, the ones that are a big flop, as long as you're taken care of, you just don't worry about it. It's because you know, I'm not there to, to uh, make a party or get people in the door or anything like that. We're just there to make sure that my service is, is where it's supposed to be at. So, um, you know, as long as, as long as service is where it's supposed to be at, if somebody had an idea that it didn't quite go so well, I just try to support them and be a strong, you know, I don't want to be uh, against them. Right. So just tell them, hey, try it next time. We'll do it a different way or whatever. Give me a call. Let me know if you want to do something again. I mean, I have seen parties that have two or three people in there for the whole night. And I've seen parties that had two or 3,000 or 30,000 if it's the picnic, the chosen few picnic, you know. Um, and uh, seeing both, both ends of the spectrum, um, it just kind of gives you an idea of, of what's, what you're about to walk into and is it is it going to be worth your time? Because I, I personally feel like I'm one of the hardest working parts of the party. I'm there before it starts, and I'm there well after it ends, and I'm carrying all the heavy equipment. Mm -hmm. So um, the other aspects, promoting, I've, I've done that before. I've given parties. DJing, I've done that before. I've been a DJ. Um, but, the, you know, just the substance of that, that person that you see carrying that equipment in and out, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Craig, know, it's you, a lot of work. I know you're chomping at the bit. No, I, I, I just want you to. But know. I want you to answer that question, too. Well, some of the, you know, sometimes it's out of your control. You know, um, you could have all the puzzles of the, you know, all the pieces of the puzzle together. You have a great concept, 
you have a great night. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, no one else is doing anything. You've got promotions is on point. Your decorations sound. Give you a perfect example. The pajama party was a success, but it was not what I expected. I actually expected a whole lot more. You know, a great DJ lineup, the great concept, every, the buzz was there, Tonka had everybody talking about it, you know, we had all the gifts and everything, but the numbers weren't where I thought it would be over the top. It was good, but it wasn't over the top. Sometimes those are the things that's just out of your control, you know? When you are actually doing a, sort of a debrief on that, are you able to pinpoint what went wrong with no. this architecture? No. Tonka says yes. I don't think you can. I don't think that you can pinpoint, because like I said, give you an example. You could have everything in order, in place, and in your, you know, it's just one of those things that happens. Unless something happened, mm -hmm. you like, like weather, weather. Or, or, or something, you know. Other than that, you can't, you know, if you've got all the moving parts exactly where okay. they're supposed to be. You and Tonka are but, in yeah, a conversation. I, I, I wanna, I wanna You're in a conversation say. after a party that you, the architecture was on point. Right. And you had 200 people less than what you anticipated. Expected, right. What happened, Tonka? Okay. So this is my part because something else I didn't bring up is I also look at the climate. I look at what's going on during the time, like if we're planning a party or something, that is one of the times where no matter what we do, we may not do what we would like to do. And that is if there are other big events going on surrounding, because at the end of the day, we kind of all dip into the same bucket uh, as far as the, the crowd, okay. right? So there are times when we've had times where it's like, oh my gosh, how, why? We, there's no way, like a lineup with with Boo Williams and Sada and you know and and uh, I forget who else, with, but we didn't do so good because it just so happened that and this was something that was um, produced after we already had the ball rolling and had everything set up. So really, not much we can do at that point, but just you know keep going hard and and hope that they come out. But again, we have been up against like maybe three other parties that are all kind of in the surrounding areas. So they're going to all of them, you know, they, or, or they might go to this one because at the time it's like, oh, well, we haven't seen this person in forever. You know, let's go to this party and then they end up getting stuck. Let me ask you the Monday, Monday morning quarterback, okay? <laughs> not, not your party, uh -huh. somebody else's party. Uh -huh. Didn't work out, <laughs> the architecture fell apart. Uh -huh. And you're Monday morning quarterback, what went wrong? It's not your party. Well, again, what we would do is we would analyze what went on that night. What 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 else was going on that that night? So that competition, competition sounds like that's a party. It's very yeah, it's very tight. And it's some a, of this is because you guys have a specific clientele. So let me describe for everybody. Let's describe who your clientele are. So you work. Let's just talk about the lodge because that is a club, but it's also a party because you're not like every week. It's more like an event-based space, yeah. which is different than like a smart bar where you can depend every Saturday night it's going to be this. No matter what DJ it is, you know what to expect. Exactly. It's a little bit like McDonald's, right? Exactly. right. Yours is not. Yours exactly. is a curated experience each time you do it. Right. That's why you have to mix it up all the time. Right. right. What was my question? But I would love to get into that. That's <laughs> okay. where I want it to be. Where it's like McDonald's. You know, you go to the lodge, well, this is what you're going to get. But it takes a lot to do that. It takes time. To, to build that, yeah. so I want to talk about your clientele. Thank you. Can we do Sixty that? years old. Um, so your clientele, you you you've alluded to this that they're that you're kind of dipping from the same pot. Yeah. Now yes. there might be what five thousand people who know about who you are, who who those are the folks you promote to. I'm just throwing that number out randomly. I don't know how what your mailing list is. I don't know. But say let's describe. Let's kind of break it down. How many people are you promoting to? Um, Roughly, what I'm sorry. my um, my friends list alone is like five thousand. Okay, right about it there. But I don't just promote on Facebook. We have a mailing list sure. that we email um, out the information, the mm -hmm. flyers or whatever. I also promote on TikTok. I promote on um, uh, Instagram and uh, a couple other places. But right. then I also promote to different groups. Okay, like City Alert. 
you know, yeah. I promote to City Alert. I promote to some of the groups where they have a larger audience, and I know that they're really active on there because a lot of people create groups. And what's the age active. range? Oh, that's right. What's the age range? Right. So the age range is probably from like forty. Okay, so from it's forty. I will older, promote to my daughter's older, crowd. Older, but older ish. Sorry, yes, older ish. Older -ish. Okay. Older -ish. That's what right. I was going to Go allude to. Uh, Back in the day when house music originated and we opened up, we had parties, and Dwayne can attest this, we would have three, 4,000 kids in one room, Navy Pier, things like that. You, we were young. I mean, we were 15, 16 years old. You know, that's another element. Now, right. the, these are the same house kids that are coming out, and they're in from 45, I'd say from 40, to 60 years and old. And so these are people who are not looking for a smart bar. They're no, looking they're not. For they're not they're looking experience for those curated Once events. in a while. Once in a while, because right. they got grandkids. Lord. I mean, hey, it is well, what it is. Know, honey, but that's <laughs> the goal. The goal yes. will get you the devil. One of my goals is to tap, down, into, why you bar? <laughs> tap into the younger market so they would experience what we're serving. Right. Because once they come in and they experience it, they're going to love it. I think you're right. Honey Dijon, who is, you know, I don't know if y'all know her name. She's a friend of ours. She's a Chicagoan, and she's blown up internationally with Beyonce's uh, new CD and her own CD, Black Girl Magic. She was just talking about this recently, that, you know, uh, it, she's got a pod. Uh, she's on, she's on uh, It's Been a Minute. If you listen to that podcast, it's really cute. It's in there. But anyway, she was saying that, look, you know, she's up there. She's in our age range-ish. Uh, that the crowd that goes out, let's keep it real, 18 to 25, it's 18 to 25, that's who's, who's showing up every week or something. That's, that's what we did. Yeah. You know? So you, that, that's a reliable audience, and if you're not catering to that audience, you have to, your curation has to be so tight because you're dipping from a smaller pool of older people who are looking to have an experience and not going to be satisfied with a room and s some nice sound equipment. Exactly. So speak to that. And then I want to open it up. For well, yeah, you, you, it's finding a, a promotion team or, you know, that can address that particular market that's into house music. And that's one of my biggest, my biggest issues. Uh, you know, Troy and I work well together for our age group. And I've been searching for someone who has that connection and their finger on the post for the younger audience from 18 to 25 that we can get into house music. But one of the biggest issues in Chicago is that age demographics is basically hip hop. It's depending and on the, the side of the, the city. The, right? the side of the city, yeah. I'm on the south side. So majority of the age group from that age group is all into hip hop. North side, majority of the kids on the north side, I feel, if they came to experience the lodge, it would be their number one place. Okay. No one hang right. out. But it's just getting them in the room. Right. How do I get them south? And we are in Chicago. I know we have a few um, artifacts that we wanted to share, and then I want to open it up for some questions from you guys. Just everyone get involved in this conversation. But um, if Jody, if we do, we have anything we want to share? Okay, we're going to see a few things. So Craig Loftus, where were you here? And, um, and what is ten fifteen? <laughs> right here was the city's tribute, the first tribute the city of Chicago did for Frankie Knuckles at the Bean. And uh, if you guys know my history, uh, Frankie and I, Frankie, we were very close, very close friends. Uh, I met Frankie when I was 15 years old. I actually became his sound engineer for 13 years. And uh, I used to be manager of 1015, his club. And he didn't know I was that young. Because I never forget my 21st birthday, he went, he's like, wait a minute. You've been managing my club for two years and you just got way too much. <laughs> but uh, 1015 was one of the places, it was Frankie's Club. Uh, it was called the Power Plant. And it is one of the catalysts of what kicked off the major movement in house here in Chicago, along with Robert Williams' uh, place, the Music Box. Those two, Friday night was the Power Plant, Saturday night was the Music Box. And that was the growing consensus through the city. So at 18 years old, guess what? We were out Friday night at the power plant, and then we go right back out Saturday night to the car. Right, right. Do you remember a conversation we had one night in my car? We were around this age. 
And we said, you know what? We got to start. We have to cut down on how much we go out. Let's we went just, out every let's night. Just, week. Let's just let's let's narrow it to like four nights a week. Four nights a week. So <laughs> like we get down to four nights a week, we'll be good. We can go to school. Because then all of a, yeah, all of a sudden, <laughs> Robert decided that they wanted to start a Tuesday night. So that means we had to go out Tuesday night. The, then Frankie said, okay, let's do a Wednesday. If Robert's yeah. doing Tuesday. And all these places were packed. They're packed. Every single they were packed. Night. I'll tell you yeah. all a really cute little quick story. Um, I would, at this time, the power plant, the music box was going on. I was working with Frankie and, and Robert. Hill. I also was promoting the, the South Side to the teen crowd with my organization, Vertigo. And I was trying to explain, because Robert didn't, uh, Frankie didn't understand that how much money could be made at both places. So I put a big party together with Frankie and Ronnie and did it at a place called Sawyer's for the Teens. Jam-packed, jam-packed. Frankie saw the numbers and how the teens would come out south to Sawyer's and places like this. And I told him, I said, see, we could do this party once a week. <laughs> we could make all this money and the music box and the power plant would just be the gravy. He didn't get it, but we ended up doing, keep doing, we kept doing parties and stuff like that. Um, I lost my train of thought, but we're gonna go. <laughs> it was something point I was trying to make. It'll, it'll come back to you. Oh, the kids. Yes. The amount of kids, but still, go ahead. No, go for it. No, go ahead. No, you go. It'll, it'll you, go. Go. It'll, 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 you go. Who's that guy on the right, though? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's me when I was this a baby. Is, I met Frank when I was 15. This is a disco Tony Shelton, who was a promoter. Uh, uh, DJ battles were the thing in the 80s. So if you, if you were a DJ, you had to compete in a battle to be taken seriously. So I don't know if that's as prevalent. I don't see DJ battles like that anymore. No, it, it, but like if you had a name, you ha you you would you had to at least compete in some DJ battles. Um, am I right? Yeah, back okay. then though, you know, we were young and it was fun. You yes. know, it was now it was, right, it was it was really fun. You know, because Lori and I would be up practicing all night. Because you see, we were a team. Uh, Craig, what well, they spell my name wrong? A yes. little lost pass. That, that, wasn't, that was Branch. not one of our flyers. But um, you know, today the the climate it, it's just not as fun as being DJs. You know, if you when you you know you do a battle of the DJs, it would turn into something totally different, which would actually be very very successful. If we if we announced that we were doing a battle of the DJs, give you a perfect example: Mike Dunn, DJ Emanuel, Gene Hunt, and Ron Carroll. The room would be jam packed. Why don't we do battle with DJs? Politi it wouldn't work. It just wouldn't. Too, attitude, much too much politics and yeah. too many attitudes okay. right now. But back then, we were young. We, we got into it. As a, I remember this. I, I remember it, this. It, they were fun, but they were, I mean, they you were know, nerve wracking. They were nerves. Yeah. It's, I, I remember it's, my first battle of the DJs at uh, Sawyer's. I had to play against Ben Perez. And it was my first time. See, Laura and I learned how to play on uh, Technique B1s. Those, those, <laughs> those are belt-driven turntables. Those are belt-driven turntables. They're not digitally controlled. They're not, so, so they, they weren't, like right, they weren't 1,200 quartz lock, right? So I'm, I'll never forget it. I'm doing my mix, and I'm like, oh, it was right on. The mix was slowing down. So I pushed the fader up because I needed yeah. to speed it up because I thought pushing it up would speed it up. Would that make sense? Push up, speed up, but you have to pull it down. It's the, it's the opposite. So I, I, just the point, I mean, you know, it was fun. Technology was different and things were happening, but the battles were a lot of fun. They were fun, and if you won, you really, you really did have a career after that. Yeah. You know, people would hire you for those things. Now, I did after this, this was back way when we were younger. But when we got a little bit older, I held uh, Battle of the DJs at the Smart Bar, which was really cool. That was fun. Uh, and I think, uh, who was that that uh, won? But I got the big giant check and everything made, you know, <coughs> yes. printed out and all of that. And that was in when social media, when we were just getting into really into the social media thing. So what I did was I had Wayne Williams, Alan King, Frankie, and someone else as a judge physically, but the uh, tenants and people could vote for that person online. They could chime in and vote for them online. Okay. I actually did two at uh, Smart Bar. We got Dwayne doing something up there. Uh, I think it's just a beautiful picture of your face. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Talk to us about what we're seeing. What is that? Oh, that's just the airport. Um, 
I was at, uh, this one of my amp racks they use uh, for power. I think that's 15,000 watt amp rack there. Um, and we used that, uh, uh, that was at the uh, Chicago Bears field, yeah, for the uh, Art of Christmas. That was that party. Um, you know, I have several racks like that, you know, that put it together. Uh, so try you know, three amplifiers. That's me on a mixing board. Uh, I was at some other club. They had some live sound going. Uh, the one at the top, here again on the phone. I was at the Chosen Few picnic. I was in my truck returning some text messages. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's been a, a good time over the years. Yeah, I know it, it was a hobby, but it's, it's still a hobby, but it's a good, it's a good hobby. I don't know who where I'm on. Doing your thing. Mm -hmm. What are we looking at? Well, we're the, you know what? I'll tell you what you look like. Go, go, yeah, back. go back. Go back. I'm going to give you the first one. You see that first position right there, guys? <laughs> that means that the song and the mix was hot. If her hand goes up like that, yeah. you did it. All right. Yes. You know what? I said that one is like that kind of just captured, captures who Toy is, you know, and how the, the music and like just the whole culture. That's that's what that's how I feel, you know. So from from me like really, like he said, really getting into the song to me just kind of. You know, the one on the end, it's like I kind of had my eyes closed and my hands just up in the air. And the other one was just me smiling. They always say I smile so hard. Yes. Um, but, you know, it's, that's it's, just it's, showing. You epitomize that phrase, house music is a feeling. Yes. But this is, you know, it's not a genre. Right. It's not a, a canon. It's right. not a culture. It's, it's a feeling. A right. Um, I, before we, I want to open it up. But before we do that, I do want to ask y'all, um, as you think about uh, why we're here, you know, the Chicago Black uh, Social Culture Map. You know, why is it important that we're having this discussion about preserving uh, black spaces, cultural spaces, dance spaces? Why, what's the importance, what's the value of that? I mean, I know it's fun, but you guys have been doing this for a long time. Why, why, why is To keep it the true essence of house music. Because house music has been sent all over the world it's, I won't say it's been diluted, but it has been changed and transformed from one thing to the next. Uh, you know, you go overseas and if you add, if you slow this down and add this sound to it, now it's got another name. It's still house music, you know. Right here, our culture, we're all getting older. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to find, it's almost just like a church. That's what I tell everybody. It's just like the church, amen. It's like the church. Right. If you do not get the younger generation involved, this culture will die. It's going to die. So, I mean, some people say that it's evolved. That, you know, that uh, it has you look evolved. at EDM, you look at, you know, all the iterations of, of house. Um, it it truly has. Music no. that it might have had some roots here, mm -hmm. but that it has just morphed into something else. And that, you, you know, things die. What do you say to that? that you have to know where you're coming from to know where you're going. Don't do them. All right. Anything else? <laughs> All right, so what we got here is a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, the flyer that I was talking about earlier, that's one side. I, we did two sides. Uh, but that was one of, that was uh, the one side of the flyer where I said I was there from like the time I got off of work to about 3, 4 in the morning, something like that. Uh, but the rest of it is just kind of um, showing like I have some like one this one here is we did uh summer George Bowl. We did that. I've done like that bowl like maybe about five times in the past uh maybe even more than that, maybe about six times in the past couple of years. Um this one down here I also um have a travel I have a travel background over thirty years. So I also um do travel uh under my own home based travel agency and I do oh, I forgot to do that, sorry. And uh, 
and I also do events. I came from a background of doing corporate meetings and events, so um, I don't do it on a corporate uh, scale. I do it more on a, you know, this was a, um, a 60 or a 60. This was a, uh, I think it was 30 year anniversary or something like that. Um, there, so that's under FSG, and then the other one that's actually the lodge, and then I'm just also kind of showing you, you know, some of the artists that I've worked with that are, you know, a big part of my life, you know, as far as the industry. This is like some of the things, like um, I was um, Jesse Saunders. I have a uh, page or whatever in his book in their work in their own words, um, and this was just kind of a event that. They did at, I think it was a VIP lounge, and they kind of invited us to come and just hang out, because I think he had something going on during that time. So that was just, you know, some of the things that, um, I've, and then of course we have, uh, when we, yes, <laughs> yes, Vintage House, um, and with Robert Williams and uh, Craig, of course, and uh, that was a, an interview that we did. Um, and this is my guy, uh, Aiden Thompson. We have uh, started at Productions. We haven't fully, um, <laughs> right, there it is. <laughs> we started at Productions. Uh, we are just kind of getting that off the ground, you know, so we're still working on that to be, you know, more information to come. And then, of course, uh, my partner, uh, Craig Austin, my partner and like my big brother. Great loft is up there, so that's the FSG. So I just and then FSG is my logo for my um, home-based travel agency and event consulting uh, uh, firm. So I want to get on a boat right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> that would be really a nice. boat, not here though. <laughs> but that's just kind of showing some of the things that I've had uh, that I'm a part of or that I have been a part of uh, that are a big thing for me as far as the industry. So that's what that page was about. I appreciate that, Tanya, and I really appreciate all of you guys sharing. I would like, like to just open it up while we have some time for just some Q&A, uh, questions that you have, please. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for doing this. I think add on to what you were talking about with regards to uh, why this is important, forms like this. I've always thought of jocks as healers, right? Shaman, conjurers, right? And so you would go to these spaces for that, right? Yeah. So you are like folk healers mm -hmm. in our community. I think that that space, which connects to the space, mm -hmm. the earlier point about them, experiencing the party, and because I've heard music before on the radio, I go, oh, I like that break. I know, I know something is there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I went to the picnic and I heard it over the sound system, mm -hmm. and I said, yes, I had to hear it in this space. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I want to say, I don't even really have questions, I'm going to still want to say. The idea of, uh, I know curated spaces are important. But if I knew you were going to be someplace, any place, like doing a five hour set, I'm going to come to that space. It would be a new space. You wouldn't have to do anything else. I just know you're going to do something there special, right? Yeah. And so I always get kind of peeved when I see five DJs and I say, hmm, I like to come to our school and old school party. Mm -hmm. You do your disco nap and you go out into the space. Yeah. And they're going to be going when I get there. Yeah. So if I'm going to miss my guy or they going off stage, I'm like, oh, you're not going to put on there. I'm going to be on the set from one to two. And then my other guys come from three to four. Right. It's something about one person anchoring a spot, maybe two. I mean, somebody got to warm me up. But one person anchoring a spot, it just makes the vibe because I know I'm hearing their personality. Sure. Right, and the vibe of the space goes on. So, mm -hmm. it's like people that. like that. And then the last thing I want to say is, most house people are zealots on some level. <laughs> so their children, <laughs> their children, their nieces and nephews getting it. And so, when my children are, and my oldest is thirty, my youngest is twenty-five. When they became old enough, they came. I brought them to them to these spots, and I'm going on the stepper too. I take them to the stepper. So you've been a stepper. So we go in there tonight. I'm gonna leave you there. So you can see where you get your thing from, right? I know you go to your hip hop spots, that's fine. But these spots are available to you. And they're going on at the same time. And some of the greatest artists are anchoring those spaces and you need to check them out too. So I just know that we we probably doing that. So there's your idea about this, this older, the younger crowd. 
we got to market to people 20, 25, right? And I just think that has to be, that'll get the younger thing that you're talking yeah. about, too. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Sir? I want to bring it in. So there is a great amount of young, uh, later millennial Gen Z audiences and DJs that are into the scene that are really thriving. There's a J Star, there's Quintastic, there's so many, and there's so many events that happen. And I have been blessed to kind of work with a lot of them now. Um, in fact, some of the pictures on the wall come from the boiler room set that I was a part of, and the majority of the audience was all Gen Z right. and so on and so forth. The one thing that I've noticed differently is that they don't understand continuity in terms of everybody comes with their separate controllers. And so there's a break in the music. You know what I mean? And it's almost if it's there's a, when you go to a concert, like there's an opening act and then there's a pause in between. Um, so not knowing that house is a continuing, you know, DJs come in mm -hmm. into each other. But then also too, not understanding the sound aspect. So what does the room have to happen? What is the anatomy of the room what has to happen in the room for um, this continuity to, to take place? If that makes any sense? Yeah, um, I take it over here. And what is this? It's like an anatomy of a room. It's like, especially when you walk in a room, it, even like when we set up, set up this, how do you look into a room and, and, and determine and make this room conducive for this space to have all the continuity that it needs to for this thing to happen? Yes. Well, if you if you have a set club, one of the ways that you can do that is that you can design your room where, like, I, I play with rotary mixers and the majority of my peers play with rotary mixers. Then I have a couple other DJs that like faders. And then you do have a couple of DJs that do controllers. You can actually design your room to have each one of these components in it. But one of the things that even Lori, the school that we come from, we look at it like this, and I'd say a real DJ, if you truly believe in your craft, you can play on anything. You can play on anything. If, if you really believe in your craft, and you are truly that that's, DJ. That's what we think. Yeah, I mean, but that's where, I mean, you know, and, and, then, and then I would say, then the younger DJs need to be educated on that. Maybe. maybe. I mean, a guy yeah. came to my house who I know as a DJ, and I didn't know this about him, but when he got on my equipment, he was like, you know, how do I sync this? And I'm like, what do you mean? How do sync, you yeah, sync right. This? We don't hit sync buttons. I'm like, yeah, there's a sync button, but I don't, you, you don't, you know. Right, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do I've been it. playing I sync for button. years. And so I, I was, I did I was not surprised sync that, record. like, that's how a lot of people have started. Right. But, the audience is not going to know the difference. And, and that's the defense. I, I get you on that. And, and then you know what? It says technology has changed you to enhance they... your craft. Okay. And, the, and it's all about the programming and not the technical aspect of right. it. And I can get with that because there was a whole big battle on Facebook and everything about mm -hmm. DJs who sync their music. And you know, we, and, and, we all know what see, we're talking well, about. To explain, guys, what it means is you know that what we're regular about. DJs so, yes. like myself and Lori, we and don't have Dwayne to, Powell. and Dwayne, we don't sync music electronically. Right. When we hear, we match beats. We match beats in our headphones. The technology that's out today will allow a person to literally walk up to a deck. As long as they got the first beat, they don't even have to have headphones on. They hit the sync button, the music, the machine is gonna automatically mix it for them. That's right. some some DJs say that's cheating. You know what I'm saying? But we learned from the way back when to match beats. You know, and they feel that way about automatic cars too. Yeah, you know, so, like all right, uh, you supposed to be driving with a stick. But again, like I say, I would, you know, uh, I don't use the sync button, but I will come to the defense of technology. Uh -huh. It's not really about can you match those? Because I mean, even as a seasoned yeah. DJ, yeah. if I learned how to sync, it would be phenomenal. You know, because I would have this over here doing something. I don't totally know, it feels like a runaway train for me. Yeah. I'm just like, what's going on? Yeah, like you know, automatic I would, pilot. I right, I, I, it freaks some people out. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, 
It's about the programming. Yes. You know, it's all about the programming. You can sync whatever you want to sync up there, but are you programming the right music? Are you syncing the right songs? Yeah, and you got to know what you're doing. Um, Kush. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So, sort of. Kind of sort of. We'll, 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 we'll come back. Yes, Kush. I think um, I would like to see more events like this. One, so I didn't, I'm in the age range, but I didn't grow up in Chicago. Uh, so, but I came in like, I don't really like house music. It sounds the same until I realized that when I went to curated parties, there was something. But then I had a problem. Okay. My problem was I was listening to music and not feeling it. Mm. Yeah. So once I started going to curated parties where I actually understood the difference and then experienced party with younger people, like they was like, are these people here high? Like, she gotta be on some. She's been dancing for two hours. And I was like, no, she's not high. And then one party, um, I think it was a Fela Kuti celebration. Oh, yeah. He came with his father, and he was like, hey, and then he started dancing, and then the energy of people around him made him change his perspective, and he cried because he had never felt music. He only listened to it. Wow. So I think that gap, and also like people mentoring younger DJs is how you get those th that, that gap to close up. Yeah. Because you can't expect them to come somewhere where you won't go, and they won't they won't expect you to come and say, "Oh, change what I do." Mm -hmm. right. There's a there's a way to deliver a message to get people on the on the same page in the same book. Exactly what you just said, um, mentoring and teaching. <laughs> That's a, my question with Dwayne. I would love to take J Star and all those guys wherever who are working on controllers and show them what it's like to mix on with rotary because it is an art. Yes, you know. that's a different day. Yes, you and then I have you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you all again for being in the space. And I just, as older, I just turned 50 last June. And um, and just like, you know, seeing y'all and like going to a spot. And I'm just thinking about you all doing this for a minute and really kind of building energy around it. I wonder if you all could just talk about what you all do to take care of yourselves. Because that kind of like, man, I mean, I'm in a spot two, I'm on a month and a half ago, and I'm like, man, Jamie Principal got on the tables at three in the morning. And I'm like, man, I'm 50, and it's three in the morning, damn, right? So, I mean, y'all y'all doing this for real. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about, like, what? It's an important question. Yeah. We've actually talked That's about this as a child. Yeah. 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 You know, that, that, that you can't vitamins, I think. You can't right. stay up all night, you can't drink all the time. Robert, that's true. Yes. I met Robert when I was 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I am 50, I'm 50, I'm 60 years old. Okay, okay. <laughs> and the man looks better than me. Right, I'm gonna okay. tell you what it is, house music okay, is. Okay, since you said that. <laughs> <laughs> No drinking, no smoking, and, and and honestly, you know, those late nights when I'm doing smart bar or whatever, that's a 5 a.m. night, I'm sleeping the next day. Like, do not call me until 4. Yeah. That's Lori with the no drinking, no smoking. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's and I don't, I don't, I don't eat meat, you know, I mean, See, it's, all a, of that. it's that, a commitment to a lifestyle. That's you know? her, it's, yeah. Now, I'm not perfect. Go I mean, ahead. but no, what I'm saying is, okay. yeah, a lot of us in the house, one, it's so funny that we, we were just talking about this, um, how house music, from drinking from the fountain of house music has given us a certain sense of the fountain of youth where our mental state is there, but our bodies aren't, to be honest with you. A lot of us, you that. but the mental, and, and, and as long as you can keep that strong mental mindset, then you can keep going. But you know, after doing those long sets, and next thing you know, your back is like killing you, and you can't even walk out the DJ booth. But you remember back when you could, but all the time while you were doing it, you weren't thinking about it because the music had you. The music yeah, had you. Yeah, yeah, if you're spinning, and I know, I know you can attest to this, if you're in the middle of it, you're awake. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're people are feeding. Energy comes from other people. You know what I'm saying? So if I can walk in tired and I leave, my wife, where is she? She was here somewhere. Hey, yeah. what's going on, sis? But she was here somewhere. She can tell you, I come in, it's four or five in the morning. I'm, yeah, I'm like this. Still yeah. up. I'm yeah. like, 
okay, you know, I gotta got to do all this energy, stuff, you know. Yeah. And then also, yes. like, say for instance, if you got one, if yes. you have a very good evening as a DJ and the room, you have to remember you are feeding everything that you have, all the energy that you have to this room. And if they're really getting into you and vibing with you, it is truly a spiritual thing happening. But it's also a physical thing happening. Right. I used to always wonder, after a great night, why Frankie would always have to pull up a chair and sit down. And, and after I, I got really into what I was doing, yeah. and then it started happening to me. When I gave a great set and it was off the chain, I'm exhausted. Exhausted. Because I've given all myself to you. That's, Joe, you've been trying to say something. Oh, yeah. I had a question about, uh, you talk about curating. Have you guys ever thought of just getting a, um, a set of DJs? Because you know you see like sets like maybe Terry, uh, James, and Vic, so they do their thing. Give them a month to curate a soundscape of, you know, of what they can do in the space versus, like a man said, having five people at one time. You know, just giving, you know, somebody, to, even, you know, I forget how many times. No, it's always, DJ managers. I got you, always. It, it, we've always asked, like an example, Vic, a lot of people don't want to do that. You know, Vic Lavender does a very, very successful, Dwayne and Vic does a, they do a very successful party uh, at my spot. And I've been trying to get them, I want to do it every week, every week or every other week. Uh-uh, they do it every three months. And to them, it is the key to the success of their event, you know. But I know exactly what you're talking about. I wish we could go back to the day, like tonight at the lodge. It's just yes. going to be me and Aiden. So we can stretch out the whole night. It, you know, it makes a difference. We're going to DJ tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my sister here, please. You've been trying to say something. You're welcome. I just wanted to thank y'all for your time and your energy. And like, I was like on my phone, like taking so many notes because I had like, so much things to learn from y'all. And I appreciate your time and like your wisdom. Like, you're a party upon us. Um, I just wanted to thank y'all for your time and your energy. And like, I just wanted to thank y'all for your wisdom. And you're a party upon us. And my, my question for this is like, when I go to these house parties today and I see how it's evolved, and I go, I learn from y'all about what it used to be like. I think about that continuity, like what has changed, and like also what is still present, and what I wish was still here, and also the things we've lost through the time. And I wonder what advice y'all would give to like people trying to curate these parties, the DJs, the people, the sound engineers, the promoters. What advice would you give to them to like? still keep that history in place and make sure that like house music and black culture is still what it's like what it was but also like make sure it's still today like figure out how to like keep that history I, I love that question Wayne why don't you start with that well uh, I can be honest with you when I was uh, uh, in high school the, the the sound systems that I used to listen to that I thought I would want to create or whatever you know I don't think it really has changed from from then to now that the expectations of what you're looking for is still kind of the same only thing that changes is if, as you get older sometimes you don't quite want it to be as loud because <laughs> when you were younger you could tolerate it when you get older you have hearing aids and all kind of stuff but you still want things to sound well, for me, you still want things to sound quality. Yes. Now, my observation and my uh, goal to reach might be a little bit different and maybe at a higher standard than a goal of someone who just comes into a party. I mean, I've, I've been in, in church with my with my mom, and you know, it's sounding <laughs> now, now, I'm sitting there like, I can't believe they would have a sound system sound <laughs> you know, that, That's me. But everybody else sitting around me is just, I mean, they, they don't like it, but it's not, it's not the focal point for them of what's going on. Now, uh, if I offer my services, go twist a knob or hit a button or whatever, and try to, you know, it. first thing, I feel that this is kind of off the question a little bit, but there was a gift implanted. In, in anybody who can find their gift, okay? And if you can find your gift that God put into you and you work in it, other people appreciate it. Now, all I do is just do what I do. I don't ask no questions to nobody. I don't solicit no comments. I just do what I do, and I've been doing it for a long time. But a lot of the people who I do it for 
when they give me feedback, and it's unsolicited feedback, it's just us, you know, we just be chopping it up. But when they give me feedback, I appreciate the accolades that they give and say about me because I realize it's just working in a gift. And it's not, uh, you know, I went over here to, even though I've got some education behind it, but, you know, it takes a little bit more than just that. You, the DJs have a passion. I've worked with a lot of DJs. And they all have the same music in the crate. Some of them have different music. As Craig said, it's the program. I can have the same sound system playing at the same level. I don't change anything. One DJ gets off the box and the party is dead. The other DJ gets on the box and the whole vibe changes. You know, and one person, oh, you turned it up for him. I haven't done a thing. <laughs> but, but some people have to look at themselves. You know, maybe just because you want to be a DJ, you, you, you don't have what it takes. I mean, literally. Um, that was one of the biggest things, DJ, uh, which swear Dwayne turned it up for him and not, you know. Okay. But, but, but yeah, really, I mean, party-wise, um, I mean, it, it's a long list of what, what people, onlookers call house parties, okay? Uh, a, a lot of years, a lot of DJs, and a lot of parties that were literally like off the chain. And so I'm that with dead. Um, there was a, a place called Gallery 21 that that I did for a short period of time. Mike Winston played on the box. The place was crowded. Everything was going good. But when Frankie Knuckles came in, it was a whole different thing. That I don't take anything from Mike Winston because he's a good friend of mine and he plays very well. But if you were standing outside or oh, standing in the line, and you didn't see Frankie Knuckles walk by you, but you're still standing in the line, you still hear this boom, boom, boom. All of a sudden, hey, what's going on in there? Because it was a whole different style. Robert, I set up at the music box. The different, there's been a lot of music boxes, locations. And, and we've been around. We've been up, to, up north, igloos, we've been, Every, a lot of places, right? And, um, you know, Ron Hardy playing, it was just, a, it was a certain thing. It yeah. was just, it's just, it wasn't that it was, if I close my eyes, you wouldn't know, you, you, I can't tell us who it is, but you can tell by the way it sound. Yeah. Presence. Yeah. You know, yes. and the way they work the sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it's Mike Dunn, whether it's Craig Loftus, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's been a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people. Now, for me, it's just mostly Southsiders because this thing you call a house or whatever we call it, dance music, mm -hmm. I had this discussion with a, a gazillion people and they all have different takes on it. It's just like, if you, I, I don't want to say it like this, but if you compare a house and you just say Jesus Christ, right? Now, you know he had a whole lot of disciples and you know a whole lot of authors in the Bible, right? But they all have a different perspective but tell the same story. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's you know deep. what I'm saying? It's, but, it's a, but John saw differently than Paul. You know, and we, if you ask Paul, and that's what's important about that. When you ask one, the facts of one support the thoughts of another. So you, you can't dispute that it happened. It's just too, so a lot of times people get hung up on who was responsible. Mm -hmm. You know, but the, it's not about who was responsible because it all took place. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's more about how it took place, yes. what you experienced when you were in, in your area, and the fact that all of it put together brought something out from, from us. That's right. You know, it brought something out. And, and, and I know that this is kind of off the, what the question was, but uh, Laura and everybody at the NUA, you know, they, they're trying to preserve that mm -hmm. so that that doesn't get taken away. Mm -hmm. And someone say, oh, it wasn't them, but this is how it was. Mm -hmm. Because they all know how it was mm -hmm. because they were there when it was. Mm -hmm. 
That's okay. And you know, Laura, she I don't know if she's even in here, but Laura. she was she went to high school, <laughs> Limp Blow with me. I had no idea she had any thoughts about liking Music, right? You're talking, talking about Lauren Lowry, who is yeah, on. But, but the yes. fact that what, you know, I, I'm at a party that I took some equipment to, and Laura was there, and I knew I went to school with her, Laura. And I said, hey, you want to ride with me? I got to go to a, a couple other places. That back then, I used to work a lot. You got to go to a couple other places that set up. She said, sure. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if, and if she was here to testify, she will tell you, we went to like three different parties, and it, it was like yeah. something was just clicking, I guess, with her. And I had no idea when she went to Northwestern and all that, that it was that state with her. And yeah. it did, and it's still, it's still kind of. She talks about you all the time. Yeah, it's, you know. Yeah, um, it, was, it was an important thing. Uh, this guy, Dwayne. Dwayne Powell. He, to, to my surprise, right, he, he now I, I see him now, right, and I, I'm not even equating 20 years ago. Yes. But he says, man, I helped carry your equipment 20 years ago. 30. I said, well, 30 years ago. <laughs> I said, what do you, you mean you helped carry? He was DJ. What do you mean you helped carry my equipment 20 years ago? He said, don't you remember when you did the Frankie Knuckles party at the Riviera? I said, sure. Sure, remember that, Chris? He said, I was the guy with Chris. I'm like, you got to be kidding. <laughs> you was with Chris? Yeah. He was like, yeah. I helped you bring the speakers in. I met you back then. Now, it's not that I, you know, uh, you know, so or whatever that I didn't remember that. Right, it's right. just that I didn't remember that. That's and the fact that he brought it back to my attention, mm -hmm. you know, because cause he's up there now. You know, back then he was down there. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh to, but to see that, that. Craig, <laughs> no joke, Craig. Was Craig down there too? The Craig. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Craig, some kind of way we hooked up. He said, man, I make councils. This is when he lived out yes. on 119th or something. He still lives out there. Yeah, I make councils. I said, you make councils? Well, I make speakers. <laughs> and then, we, you know, we start talking. Yeah. And now I know Craig, Craig, Frankie. Now, I was a little kid, like, loving Frankie Knuckles. See, but not because I was at the warehouse. Yes. But because when he came to Mendo, this was a legend right. coming, coming into to my Mendo. domain. Right. To DJ, right? Mendel's a Catholic high school on the south yeah. side that and, sort of and, emulated the, the bar scene, but for kids. Right, and his his sound man was a guy named Dave. Yes. Now, Frankie was religious. He's like, look, I set up, if I DJ, Dave sets up. That's just and how Frankie I was always religious about who set up his sound. Right. He's and very picky. When Gallery 21 came around, a friend of mine named Reggie, Reggie Corner, good guy, right? Been in my corner like, man. Like a damn, like a man chili. And he's he still like, well, you know. Yeah. Reggie said, "Hey, he said, said we pay, Frankie, we paying you to DJ. We we not paying you to tell us who we're gonna have a sound for." Oh my, okay. You know, and I had set up the gallery, right? Yeah. Well, well, Frankie came, you know. I'm gonna check it out, right? He said, then I had some vintage stuff. I had a rotary mixer, and big old Macintosh amplifier, and some all kind of stuff. But anyway. He came in and, do, 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 and it was, you know, it was beat. Yeah. So from there, it was. You were the new sound guy. All right. right. All right. I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop you there because we, we're running over. But thank you. The gospel according to Dwayne. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I like the Jesus thing. I like it's, it's, it's all good. I, I think we're kind of out of time. I think there was a few more questions. But, um. Y'all gonna stick around for me? Oh, did you have one, Justin? Just one. Make it quick. Okay. So I'm in that, that age group, right? So I've been working with the Benefit Top Show. Thank you for the Lord. He's part of our team. Yes. yes. Twenty twenty. So um, quickly as I came on doing digital media and like public relations for them, I, I'm a music lover, not a DJ, so I can't get on the stage. But um, I love music, and I remember uh, one of my first shows that I did with them. Um, I think Mike Dunn was um, the guest, mm -hmm. and it was kind of the same conversation. These conversations have been being had for years. Yes, years, years, same years. conversations. Um, I've been having the conversations for years, too. So I think one of the big things that we even discussed on that show is that, um, well, Mike Dunn had said that he was in Vegas or something, 
and they, it was a bunch of young kids, they were playing music, and I think Fade by Kanye West came on, you know, Fade the Simple, um, from House Music Song. Exactly. So he was like, like shocked, shell shocked that all the young people were like, you know, turning up. Yeah. Like, yeah. He came yeah. in, he was like, wow, they know this. And then he said his surprise was Fade. And he was like, ah, like they, they don't know it. So I think one of the big things that um, a lot of people my age that are into hip hop or knowing about these samples and everything, um, they don't really get the, the artists aren't giving dedication to the samples. Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, Beyonce just did a house music album. Drake did one. People didn't like that. Um, I love both of them. Mm -hmm. um, Drake just came out with another album. Um, and he sampled one more time by Bad Punk, and people love that. You know, it's we, it's our age group. We love it. I don't think we're getting getting the knowledge of like where it's coming from. Right. Like people are thinking these, these are new beats. Yeah. Right. Right. People are thinking like this is a new beat. And that's what I was talking about the exposure. And house music got yeah, their beats. If I can get, if yeah. I can get them in the room. Yes. Just to Everybody's be exposed to it, because I just like you just said, the song that uh, is "Mysteries of Love" that they sample. Uh, my two of my nephews work at the club. They're nineteen, right? They were cleaning it up, and we were playing "Mysteries of Love," and they were like, "Well, that's fake." Mm -hmm. They're like, "No, that's <laughs> right. 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 right." But I had that same experience. Right. I was at a friend of mine's club out south, and it was all hip hop night. I was playing my little casino thing, and uh, it came on. And they start screaming. And I was like, what is going on in here? Because yeah. it was Mysteries of Love came on and the whole room screamed. Yeah. And then I thought it was fake. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, let's, one more, one more. A lot of, a lot of the times, that, um, from, my, from my experience at least, as if I want to be in those spaces, like, like the lodge and everything. Um, but where I get my house music experiences from is a lot of times like those House, family house party. Now we have an age group where we're not the kids. We, we're people's kids. Um, but we are able to party with the adults. You can go out. So yeah. we out with them. And a lot of times, um, some of those spaces that have like the house music, um, you know, events and everything, they have like those age limit restrictions. So we can't necessarily always get into them or we, we don't know where those How events are. I want y'all to continue this conversation so I can let we okay. can switch gears. But Justin, thank you. Thank you for being interested. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your participation. Can we give a round of applause for our <laughs> Turn it back over to Meta, who's going to introduce our next panel after a short break. Thank you all. Yeah, so we're